Hello and welcome to another episode of the Oxford Online Maths Club. My name's James and today I'm joined with by Jonah. Hello. <laughs> Brilliant. Good to have you with us on the stream, Jonah. Um, and good to have you watching at home or at school, wherever you are. Uh, if you're joining us live, you're welcome to join the live chat just underneath Jonah on screen. Um, I can see a few people over there already. Hi to Miles and Gabe and Kai. Kai says that Kai missed last week because of half term. So it's good to have, <laughs> good to have people here as always. Joni, you've been on stream before, haven't you? Yes, I have. Two times. Yes. We were just trying to remember when they were. I think it was last year and the year before. So maybe yeah. maybe people who joined the Math Club this year haven't met Jonah before. Jonah, what, what do you study and what year are you in? Um, I study maths, but I'm on the purer side of maths, as I'm sure you'll gather from this talk. And I'm in third year. Very nice. Um, purer side of mathematics. I think you previously talked about quantum mechanics, though, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was... The back episodes. A bit of bit of quantum mechanics, but how it related to group theory. I thought I'd chuck it in there just to appease some applied mathematicians. Okay, okay, I, and I was appeased, so that's the, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the applied mathematician on the call. Um, uh, today, no quantum mechanics, though, right? I can see your title Absolutely. is graph theory, um, and we talk about graphs. I put something in chat to brief people to say that it's graph theory, but not the sort of graph searching from a level or equivalent. Um, before we get going with that though, I'm going to do the how was your day poll, because I like okay. a good how was your day poll. Um, do you remember this? We I can't remember when we started doing this. We I don't believe that year. was our last time I did it. No, well, welcome to, welcome to the new and exciting technology. Um, we now ask people how their day is. <laughs> um, uh, and at the moment, people are voting on a scale of 1 to 5. I don't think you can see this on Zoom. Not very well at all. <laughs> there's, a, there's a tiny little bar chart that shows that people are having about a four star day today, which is pretty good on, on the scale of these things. Um, Let's see if I can turn it into a five. Yeah. Hey, that's what we're looking for. Um, <laughs> I'm always looking after people who give us one or two stars because I think your day has to be going quite badly to be one or two stars. Last week people were ill, people were not very happy. This week, how's your day going, Jonah? Are you having a four star day like chat? <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I had quite a restful, relaxing day. I try and have at least a couple of days a week where I don't even look at any real work and just try and have a nice day. Went to Port Meadow, did some nice outside stuff. So yeah, I'm having a pretty good day at the moment. Um, cool. I um, yeah, okay, that's really nice. Um, sorry, I'm just catching up with chat. Um, Kai behind the behind the raising chat is still going. Uh, some people in chat remember Jonah from before. Um, <laughs> so that's nice. Um, there's also some questions about state schools, which I think I will try and type responses to later at some point. Um, I'm not very good at doing admissions questions at the same time as math club stuff is happening. Um, okay, and people's average day there I think has worked out slightly over four stars, which is high for us. Good to um, hear. Good stuff, right? Okay, let's uh, get back to the people who know this. Know that I'm very bad at messing around with the polls and things. Okay. Uh, Brilliant. And Joe, people want to know which college you're at as well. Oh, you, you know, I, I don't know if you guys can see that very well on my shirt. It's Worcester College. Worcester College. That's very nice. You've got the college branded branded hoodie there. Yeah, if there's any time to bring it out, it seems like now is appropriate. All of my students, all at the same time, got, I think, quite cheap matching jackets or like the coats, coats sort of plas plasticky coats, which I thought, was quite, I thought was quite cute that they all turned up to tutorials wearing the same. <laughs> with their initials. I thought they'd all joined a sports team, but no. Um, right. Uh, okay. Um, I think we should do some graph theory. That's all right. I'm getting a yeah. little bit... I'm trying not to get too distracted by, by chat. The feeling in chat that I want to echo here is that people weren't here last week, but were here the week before. So, hi, if you weren't here last week for half term, but you're here again, I see you live. And I should stop talking and let Jonah do some graph theory. Jonah, over to you. Brilliant. All right. So today we're going to be doing some graph theory. I hope it's an area that you're unfamiliar with, most of you, because it'd be great to introduce this to you. It's, a, it's an amazing area of math that's constantly evolving, constantly changing, and is really, really pertinent to everything going on at the moment that's interesting in maths. So you guys are lucky that you came to the talk today because hopefully we're going to cover some really interesting information. Um, as James mentioned earlier, um, when we say graph theory, these aren't the kind of graphs like y equals x or all those kind of cubics, quadratics. It's a very different thing, completely different area of maths. Um, but it's, it is absolutely amazing. It's a very, very interesting area of maths. Um, so we're going to start by talking about what actually graph theory is, what we do with it. 
And then maybe we'll try and solve some really old unsolved math problems or math problems that went unsolved for hundreds of years. If we get the chance, if if, if we manage to solve some of those problems, that'd be very nice. And then maybe I'll leave a very, uh, I mean, an unsolved problem for you guys to have a go at if you fancy. Um, but if you do manage to solve it, you do have to, uh, you do have to give me your reference in the Fields Medal acceptance speech. Um, that's just, I'm just putting that out here now, just in case you do manage to solve that problem. <laughs> um, on to graph theory. So what is a graph? Well, I hope I hope the two on the left of my screen, hopefully on the left of your screen too, those are graphs. They are a bunch of points connected by lines. Not particularly complicated to look like to see what a graph is. They are points connected by lines. There's nothing much more to them. The picture on the right, however, of a nice picture that's colored in, in a slightly strange way, um, relates to something called map coloring, which we will talk about later. And it's very interesting. And I mean, I, me and James probably disagree on whether the problem remains unsolved, seeing as it's computationally solved. But I'll talk about that later on. But anyway, that 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 will relate to later on in the talk. But it it has a very interesting um, relationship with graph theory. And so we're going to talk about some amazing applications of graph theory, like how it can solve something called the four color theorem and how it can talk about a load of other things as well. Um, so we'll get started on what a graph actually is. So what is a graph? Um, we start, we'll, we'll take a plane or we'll take a square or whatever, just something we can draw our graph on. Maybe you can think of it as like a piece of paper and we'll put a couple of points. I'll normally represent these by quite big circles colored in or whatever. They might be, they'll probably be black circles. I might color them later on for the purpose of something, but they're just points. Um, we call these vertices or nodes. I'll interchange between them. It doesn't particularly matter. Um, but yeah, so that's what we start with. And then as you saw before, we connect these, we connect these vertices by lines and we call these lines edges. So start with points and then we have lines which connect these vertices. Quite a simple idea to start with. There are two rules on how we connect these vertices by lines. First rule, between any two vertices, there can be at most one edge. So this picture below is not allowed. We can't have two vertices connected by Two edges, like by an edge, well, two edges between them. There can be at most one edge between any two vertices. And the second rule is, no edge can start and end at the same vertex. So we can't have a loop. If we have an edge that starts at a vertex, it's going to have to end at a different vertex, and that is going to be the unique edge between any two given points. So that's a graph. Um, I think a key thing to I, I'll also for the clarity, I'll put these x's on there just to make it very clear these are not allowed. Um, for Clarity, um, we, we 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 don't need edges. Like edges aren't a necessary part of our graph. You could have no edges between all your vertices. You could have one edge between 20 vertices. Um, I invite you maybe at home to work out what the maximum number of edges you can have between n vertices is, because bearing in mind, there are a, like, you can join every vertex up to every other vertex by an edge. And then we can't add any more because we can't have repeated edges. We can't have two edges between any two vertices so there is going to be a um a maximum number of edges um in case you're interested these uh, a maximum graph graph where all the edges are drawn all possible edges is called a complete graph and a graph where no edges are drawn it's called an empty graph so that is an interesting starting point so this is what graph theory is it's a study of these slightly like quite simple idea um of like quite a simple concept just some points joined by lines um they get more interesting, and we'll do some very cool maths with them. Um, here's some examples of graphs. Um, the top left one is a complete graph because, as you can see, we couldn't draw any more um, lines. We we couldn't draw any more edges between those vertices um, because every um, pair of vertices has an edge between them. And the bottom right, uh, the bottom left one is an empty graph because um, it's got no edges. Uh, fairly simple. Uh, don't ask me why I they all have four vertices. Um, number of vertices can be any integer you want. In reality, you could have an empty graph with no vertices, which would just be nothing. But that's slightly uninteresting and doesn't really allow us to do much maths on that. So probably we want some vertices. Um, it doesn't have there could be any any integer number of vertices. I chose four because I started with the graph on the top left and colored and, and erased certain edges to produce more graphs. So that's why all my graphs have four uh, four. Uh, vertices because they're the same graph just with certain edges erased by me coloring them in white um sorry jonah is that it's slightly behind chat so i'm going to describe the one on the bottom right 
it's it's four points and there's two edges, but the the edges one of the edges joins the left two points and one of the edges joins the right two points. Like one and two are joined and three and four are joined. Is that a graph? Is that, <laughs> that... <laughs> it's good. that's a very good question. Yes, that is a graph. A graph can be called disconnected, for example, if it is a graph doesn't have to be connected. We call a graph connected if from one vertex you can get to any other vertex. So, for example, um, the top all, all the top um, the top ones are connected and the bottom middle one is connected because if we start at one vertex, we can travel along edges to get to any other vertex. That's not a requirement for our graph. A graph can be disconnected. For example, our bottom right one is the disconnected graph. I mean. It, you could call it if you wanted to be um, very like formal about it. You could call it the disjoint union of the complete graph on two vertices, because each of those is a complete graph on two vertices, because the most edges you can have between two vertices is one edge, and there's two of them, and they're disjoint. So it would be the disjoint union of the complete graph of two um, two vertices. But yes, so brilliant question. We don't need to have um, the everything connected to everything else to make it a graph. For example, the bottom left one, the one that's got no edges, that's got four different components. It's got four vertices, and from each one, you couldn't get to any of the other ones. So therefore, it's just disjoint into four connected components. And the bottom right one is um, disconnected, and it's disjoint into two connected components. Um, but these, these are really interesting questions, and we often only consider connected graphs because, say, we have a disconnected graph, we can just consider each connected component separately. Um, and for certain maths, for example, you may have heard of a traveling salesman problem where some uh, salesman needs to travel along certain edges and certain vertices. If we have a disconnected graph, then if the salesman is in one connected component, they wouldn't be able to get to the other connected component. So therefore, we only need to consider the connected component the uh, salesman starts in. So therefore, we don't really need to worry about disconnected graphs. And in this talk, I won't really worry about them. They are very doable, and there's plenty of interesting maths that happens on them. But in reality, it can normally be simplified to a connected case. Isomorphic graphs. Um, those of you who remember my talk on groups last, uh, last year or however long ago that was, um, you may remember I talked about isomorphisms between groups. Groups are incredibly interesting mathematical structures and actually have a really interesting relationship to graphs. Um, for those of you who are interested, um, you can represent a group via a graph, and groups are isomorphic if and only if their graphs are isomorphic. Completely unnecessary, overly complicated, but just in case you're interested and want to find a connection between graphs and groups, uh, the definition of isomorphic is basically equivalent. But you then you go, okay, what is the definition of isomorphic for graphs? Um, we can draw graphs in different ways, but it doesn't change the fact that they're the same graph. For example, as long we could move vertices around, but as long as we keep the edges they're connected to the same, that's fine. It's still the same graph. Um, so yeah, it, the key point is you can move vertices, you can bend edges, you can stretch them. As long as you don't break edges, you're fine. And bearing in mind that we saw on the previous page graphs where edges overlap. So we don't have the problem that, oh, we can't stretch an edge in a certain way because it might overlap with another edge. It's fine. We're allowed to overlap edges. Um, so stuff, for example, like this, these are all the same graph. I've just been moving the vertices around and maybe, maybe changing how the edges are drawn. We normally draw edges with straight lines for simplicity, but that's not a requirement at all. And in fact, um, like we can draw edges with curly lines and I could go all over the place doing an edge wherever I want. That's completely fine. It just kind of clutters the um, the diagram up a bit. So normally we draw graphs in the most simple way possible, um, which would be either the one on the left or the one on the middle here. But they're all the same graph, and that's very important to recognise because it could be like we don't want to accidentally um, connect. Uh, we don't want to accidentally like talk about two different graphs and consider two different cases when they're actually isomorphic because that could mean we're doing more work than we need to be. Um, in case you want to see here, these two graphs are also isomorphic. If you can think about it, I've taken the square here and I've kind of like moved these vertices like here, uh, like kind of rotated these ones like this. I'm not sure if that's very clear on screen. Um, but the point is, is that you can tell these are the same because if you start at one of the vertices and just continue around the path, you'll see that we'll get to another vertex, then a third vertex and a fourth vertex and then back to the first. So you can see that you could trace out the same path as if you were going around a square. And therefore, it is the same. It, it is the same shape. It is the same graph. Um, 
I'm hoping that's clear to you. Please do let me know in chat. If it's not, I could probably provide a more in-depth explanation. The main problem with graph theory is because it's right on the verge, it's like the edge of pure maths as you're teetering towards applied maths. We normally just say, ah, it's approximately the same. Don't worry about a formal mathematical definition rather than actually trying to formalize. You can wiggle these vertices around and stretch these edges and it's still the same thing because that seems like a real like mess to try and formalize something like that. But <laughs> there are questions in chat about isomorphisms, which I'm going I'm yeah, to try and do. I'm going to try and do. Um, also, hi, shout out to somebody who came on an event on Monday. Um, hi. Um, <laughs> Miles wants to know, what if you put two edges completely on top of each other? I think that's not a thing, right? We try to, like, in reality, the, the main reason we wouldn't want to do that, it doesn't stop it being a graph, but it's kind of just, then you're hiding some of the information you have. The point of graph theory is we normally want to re represent graphs in as simple a way as possible. And obviously putting two edges completely on top of each other, it wouldn't be complete. I mean, what we could have is we could have like three vertices here. These two are connected and these two are connected. And then we'd have overlapping and that would just be a bit awkward and it would look a bit weird and we wouldn't be able to tell which ones are actually connected. So we don't do that purely because uh, it, it's not like it's completely invalid. We just don't want to hide any information. Yeah. So you could put edges on top of each other if you really, really, really want to, but... Um... You'll only confuse yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and there's something else about um, isomorphism is it's more than just relabeling the corners, right? Because that last example on the right hand side, the corners are all in different places. Um, so exactly. there's, a, there's a question from Nikita, I think, um, asking if it's just about relabeling them or. or well, relabeling, so. for example, might not lead to nest i mean relabeling is an isomorphism because we haven't labeled our vertices our vertices don't have labels we haven't distinguished them from one another there's nothing like it's not like we've got vertex one two and three like for example on the le left graph if we had vertex one two and three and two was in the middle then relabeling the vertices would change the number of um other vertices that two was connected to say if we moved if we relabeled the first vertex to two now two isn't connected to two other vertices anymore it's only connected to one so um, we normally don't label our vertices purely for the benefit of that could be complicated and might cause us to misunderstand something. Um, it's, more, it's more about just moving the vertices around and moving the edges around in the plane, but keeping their connections connected. If there's a line, we can move that line around, but we won't break it apart. So there's a discussion in the chat happening actually about whether, whether any two graphs with the same number of vertices are isomorphic to each other. Um, and I think maybe you could give us an example of something that's not isomorphic to the thing exactly. on the left. Um, well, if you think, for example, back to, I, I thought it'd be a good idea to think back to the first page where I showed you some examples of graphs. I might actually be able to quickly, there, there's, um, some examples of graphs. These, like, for example, the one with no edges has the same number of vertices as the one above it um, with four, uh, with six uh, um, edges, sorry. Um, but clearly they're not isomorphic because I can't I can move those vertices around all I like. I'm not going to magic six edges out of nowhere. Um, a very interesting question actually is the two graphs with the same number of vertices and the same number of edges are those also isomorphic? Um, yeah, we and can't prove that with the ones on the screen, right? <laughs> because yeah, all of these ones have got different that. numbers of edges. So, mm. um, but that is a very interesting question. Um, we'll probably see an example of that, but I would be more than happy if someone uh, from if someone from the chat was able to give me some sort of example, okay. maybe using one of the ones on this screen to prove why that's not the case. It's going to be want... really hard for them to put it in chat, but I think your mm. question is, if two graphs have got the same number of um, vertices and the same number of edges, can you always deform one of them into the other? Are they isomorphic under you know, move it, moving? Maybe you have to move the vertices around and stretch all the edges and but um, not breaking anything or not disconnecting anything. Yeah, um, exactly. Can you always nice deform them up. into each other? I think looking at the bottom right one should give you a nice answer for that. Have you got an idea on the bottom right one? Okay. Right. Your bottom right one definitely well, okay. provides you a nice answer. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give people in chat a minute to... Put, people in chat are having a go at this. Um, and there's also a question, why have you banned, why have you banned loops that go round to themselves and double double edges? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, no reason at all. The answer is no reason at all. We call those graphs multigraphs, and they are perfectly interesting mathematical objects to study. The main reason we don't allow that here is because 
certain mathematical problems, like the ones we're going to be discussing today, don't work with multigraphs. The problems don't make sense with multigraphs. But multigraphs are a completely valid mathematical objects and have lots of interesting math behind them. We just merely define our graphs to not have those properties so that we don't have those kind of issues. Okay. So it's like like studying whole numbers instead of studying complex numbers. Like they're both equally valid, but one of them is a bit easier to start with. <laughs> okay. Um, and chat has, I think, solved, solved your problem by thinking about whether things are connected or not and thinking about having maybe three edges that maybe go around in a loop that you can't break or having two edges that maybe connect things versus disconnected. Um, exactly. The people, are describing, people are describing a V-shape with an extra vertex as being different from the thing on the bottom right. That brilliant. Okay. Descriptions in chat because you can't do images. <laughs> yeah, no, the V-shape the v, the v with an extra dot, I very much like that. That is a very good description of the graph. There's the same number of vertices and edges as the bottom right one, but it's different. Fortunately, you guys are going to get a go at these because I've created some graphs. <gasps> And you guys can give a go at seeing if you compare up which ones are isomorphic and which ones aren't. Is that coming through? So these are numbered and they've... <laughs> I shouldn't say too much, I guess, when I see them. They've all got the same number of vertices. Have they all got the same yeah, number of vertices? I thought I'd make it slightly more difficult than just counting the number of vertices. Have they all got the same number of edges? No. <laughs> Some of them have got more edges than others. That's maybe where I'd first look, and then I'd maybe start thinking about um, uh, moving things around. Uh, question in chat, are these called trees sometimes? Oh, ah, someone says, are they called trees? And I think I vaguely remember what a tree is. But do you want to tell Trees me? are a very interesting part of graph theorem. Um, you, uh, you may know what a cycle is. Whoever asked that question you may know what a cycle is. A cycle in a graph is basically, can you start at a vertex? and travel around the edges and get back to the same vertex. That's what, if, if okay. you can do that on the graph, you call that graph cyclic. And a tree is a connected graph that is acyclic. So a connected graph that doesn't have any of those loops. So that's what a tree is. You may be able to see that none of these graphs are trees. Graph theory is full of these words, right? Like, um, I know that, mm. a, so a tree, yeah, okay. a tree is a graph without any cycles. And then a forest is, a collection of trees, like a, oh, exactly. What and else are you going to call a collection of trees? Is, yeah, a leaf is the basically the end point of a tree. The tree that's a, a vertex that's only connected to one other vertex in a tree. Oh, adorable. Okay, right. <laughs> trees and leaves and forests. None of those on the screen because I think all of the ones I can see on the screen have got loops in. They've got cycles. Exactly. But they are all connected. People in chat think that one and five are isomorphic. Are they right? Yeah, they are. That is a brilliant observation. I thought one and five were the hardest to spot. Yeah, because they look so different, but they are definitely isomorphic because by the same logic we discussed earlier, you could start at one vertex and traverse around all the other vertices and get back to the same one you started with. And hence, if I moved them around and shuffled them a bit, I'd get back. Uh, one and five are the same because they have the same edges between them. I could number one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five, and I'd go one to two to three to four to five the same way that I would in graph one. So you can see why they're the same. Brilliant. I think that makes me think about the way that five is a prime number. Um, I'm just going to say that and maybe chat can fill in the details at home or something. Um, there's something nice about the patterns you've drawn and five being prime. It makes me want to try something similar with other prime numbers. Um, <laughs> there are also some votes in chat. This is really increasing our um, uh, chat engagement scores. Um, some people think two and three and some people think not two and three. Do you want to talk about two and three? Yeah, two and three are a pretty interesting problem. Um, uh, I mean, you may be able to tell, you may not be able to tell, as some of you have rightly demonstrated. Uh, they are isomorphic, are they? two and three. Oh. Um, I think a key way to think about that is you look at, the, um, we call the degree of a graph the number of edges connected to it. It's just a complicated term for something the, that's The not degree of cool. each of the vertices in the graph yeah. is the number of edges. Okay, so in that top right one, two, three, two, three, two, okay. Exactly, and so you can look at the two degree three vertices, and what do you notice about them? Well, they're connected to each other, and on one side of them, they've got one vertex between them, and on the other side of them, they've got two vertices between them. Um, that's perhaps not the most <sighs> obvious way to say it, and if I had a really nice graphic that deformed one into the other, that'd be way nicer. But yeah, <laughs> between the two degree three vertices, on one side we've got like uh, one between them and on the other side we've got two between them 
And that's exactly what we have in graph two as well. We have two degree three vertices, and on one side we have two between them, and on the other side we have one between them. Okay, so um, I should take I should take the wiggly line and deform it to be straight, but then also shunt shuffle around the other bits in the corner. Exactly. Those two around there to get them around. I see that's very sneaky. This feels very non-trivial. Um, <laughs> I like your idea of looking at the degrees. Um, that's given me a new idea actually, um, which I suspect I've heard before. Um, previously we. Maybe the, if the ver number of vertices matches, they're isomorphic. Then we thought, or oh, maybe no, they might have different number of edges. So then we put in, maybe if they have the same number of vertices and the same number of edges, they're isomorphic. Um, now you've said that we should look at, we could look at the degree of each of the vertices. So I guess my new hypothesis or my new guess to try and prove or disprove is something like, if two graphs have got the same number of vertices, the same number of edges, and the same set of degrees, then maybe they're isomorphic. I mean, if not, then they're not isomorphic, but maybe they're isomorphic if, if those things match up. Don't that's tell me really if that's true or not. I think you know if that's true or not. It's an interesting <laughs> question, and I'd recommend, if you want to think about that, think about the same kind of graph where you have two degree three vertices and a path between them, but maybe in cons instead consider six vertices. So you have two degree three vertices, and you maybe have a different number of vertices on each side. Would that change the, if you, if you change the number of vertices on each side of them, Maybe something interesting would happen, or maybe it wouldn't, but maybe something interesting would happen. I didn't follow that book, but, but, but yeah, I, I, I do want to sketch some pictures. Maybe chat can help me out. Um, uh, in chat, Nikita has referred to that as a sequence of degrees for, for the kind of barcode or something of how many, what degrees. Yeah, there's get. actually really interesting maths behind it. I can't remember what it's, oh, it's called a proof of code. That's what we call it. Proof, proof of code. code. That's something that Proof of code. Um, it's actually very interesting that you can completely understand a graph by a pr it's proof of code. Um, but it's proof of code is basically how you would take apart the graph and reform it again. Um, it, it, but it does very much refer to the degrees of the vertices in a certain way. It's, it's a really, really interesting area of maths, and I strongly recommend people to go and look up proof of codes after we're done here. Okay, further reading. Um, people in the chat think four and six are isomorphic. If you move the top right corner of six, down a bit, then it becomes a kind of deformed version of four, and we think that's it. We think that's all of the isomorphisms. Yeah, in, that's brilliant. Between um, these, you, you put pairs up. <laughs> you didn't have exactly. to, but you put them up in pairs. I put them up in pairs. Um, we can see that one and five aren't isomorphic to any of the others because all of their vertices are degree two, whereas yeah. all the others have a degree of three vertex. And no matter how much deforming I do, I can't break edges, so therefore there will always be a vertex as degree three. Seeing that four and two for example, on isomorphic, um, slightly hard, but then again, you just look at the paths between, you take the two degree three vertices and look at the paths between them. Two has on one side a path that has two vertices on it and one side a path that has one link, uh, um, linked one on it. And four has three paths that have one vertex on them. I know not a brilliant description and kind of hard <laughs> to do over a camera like this. Um, but hopefully that is a relatively clear explanation of why four and two aren't isomorphic. I'd look at the degree two nodes, I think. Or maybe that's what I was looking at before you said look at the degree three nodes. The, the degree two nodes are not connected in picture four. But in picture two, there's a pair of degree two nodes that are That connected. is a very good, yeah, that is a very good way of putting it, yeah. I'm going to All right. my last um, question in chat. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about planar graphs because planar graphs are something that we really like to talk about in graph theory because planar graphs are nice graphs basically they're graphs that can be drawn so that no edges overlap um the way, reason i said that can be drawn so that no edges overlap is because we've just talked about graphs I, that are isomorphic to each other so we call a graph planar if it's isomorphic to a graph that can be drawn so that no edges overlap um you may want to think to yourselves can you think of a graph that can't be drawn so that no edges overlap. And that's actually not an easy thing to do. Um, I will, I want to, I'd like to give you an example, because uh, for example, you can, because it's not easy to come up with non-planar graphs because you have to have a lot of vertices and a lot of edges to get there. Um, the smallest um, non-planar graph has five vertices and all the possible edges between any pair of vertices. That's the smallest non-planar graph in case you're interested, you can't reshape those edges, reshape those vertices, move them about, whatever, so that it, they don't overlap. You will always have edges that need to overlap when you draw that. Um, so that's a, like that, so most graphs you see will be planar. For example, 
that's a planar graph because none of the edges overlap. Um, this one is a planar graph because although we do have two edges overlapping, I could move that bottom vertex, shift it up into the center of that triangle, and then no, vert uh, no edges would be overlapping. And this one, for example, this is planar because as we saw on the previous page, this was graph five and it's isomorphic to graph one, which is just a cycle like that, which is like it was like a pentagon kind of shape um, where no edges overlapped. So therefore these are all planar. So planar does not mean no edges overlap. It means it's isomorphic to a graph where no edges overlap. Um, that may also be worth saying that a graph is isomorphic to itself because if, for example, you take the graph on the left, it is isomorphic to a planar, um, to a graph that can be drawn with no edges overlapping because it's isomorphic to itself. Maybe I'm overcomplicating that. Maybe that didn't need to be said. But just to formalize it. Well, numbers are equal to themselves or graphs are isomorphic to themselves. If you topologically yeah. deform it by not doing anything at all, then you get back to where you started. Um, well, again, this gets overly complicated when you go into that. I was doing some logic recently where you have to really stress the axiom that all things are equal to themselves. Like that is a very important axiom. In and it's, it's just, it really it gets quite like, irritating after a while. Doesn't sound like a very useful axiom to me, but what do I know? Um, Nikita in chat wants to ask about bipartite graphs. I'm going to delay it though because I think you've got a bipartite graph coming up later on. We do have so a bipartite graph. You haven't mentioned them yet, and we're going to mention them later, so I won't put you out of sequence. Um, bipartite graphs are really interesting though. That word on screen at the moment, that word can is doing quite a lot of work, isn't it? Mm, um, yeah. <laughs> like, it, it makes it easier than coming up with a formal mathematical definition because a formal right. mathematical definition, I'd need to formalize what isomorphism is, and therefore I'd need to formalize what. I take this vertex and I move it around a bit. What well, I need to formalize how I wrote that. So I really don't want to formalize how I write that. So instead, I just use the word can, and hopefully, people who aren't super formal mathematicians aren't going to argue with me. Let's see what's in there. Um, oh, okay. So I got got a little exercise for people whilst they're talking in chat, whilst they're having ideas about planar graphs. Um, see if you can work out which of these are planar graphs. Um, you might recognize the one on the right. That was, I think in one of the first pictures of pictures of graphs that's because um whoever mentioned earlier was talking whoever was talking about bipartite graphs you may be able to see that the one on the right is a bipartite graph and it's a graph we're going to be talking about in a bit um but yeah which of these are planar so it's, all of them have got crisscrossing happening on the screen but mm. maybe some of them can be deformed into into a graph with no crossings, no, no, no crossings. Something exactly. Like Plane graphs are interesting though because I think I think people really find myself included, if I'm honest. Um, the thing on the left there, where there are two edges that cross, but that's not a vertex in between. That's just two edges that cross. The vertices are the points that you've defined to be vertices, where you've drawn the big blobby circles. It's not any crossing point gives you a vertex. The, mm. the definition way back of what your graph was is, oh, I will specify some vertices and I will draw in some edges. Um, and it looks like you've gained an extra vertex, but it doesn't count. It's not a vertex. Um, it's just not. two lines. Yeah. It we doesn't don't help. We, <laughs> we're not going to be super formal about it. And if two edges happen to overlap, we won't call it, we, we understand that happens and we're okay with it. Um, and that's why I've drawn my vertices with big black circles or on the right, like big red circles to make it very clear vertices are not necessarily where edges overlap but that's like planar graphs vertices are where edges overlap um or where edges meet to be more precise so maybe you'd prefer planar graphs if you don't <laughs> don't like looking at intersections <laughs> right yeah okay it's the selling point of planar graphs right if you find that confusing then um we're we're not gonna not gonna have those in our planar graphs it's like a subset a mm. subset of nice ones um people are voting people are voting for each of them um there's huge amounts of chat engagement oh, Jonah's, Jonah's live streams always have lots of chat uh, chat live streams um, engagement. Um, the left one has got the most votes at the moment, I think, with the idea being we can deform one of those diagonal lines so that instead of drawing it as a straight line, we could draw some sort of curved line around. I can't remember yeah, that... if, you, if you've got a slide for that or are we just going to describe it? <laughs> yeah, that... You've got a slide for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there are two possible. Uh, there, there are obviously infinitely many because I could all take any um, graph and change it slightly, but basically the same shape. But here are two examples of ways we could draw that graph. Um, so, for example, like you said, we could take one of the diagonal ones and stretch it around the outside, or we could bring, for example, the top right 
um, vertex inside the triangle formed by the other three. And that would also be planar. Cool. Uh, opinions are divided about the other two, I would say. Um, uh, I would say that votes are a bit in favour of two being planar. Um, mm -hmm. And three, I would say it's about 50 50. Um, yeah, thanks, Kai, in chat as well. Um, somebody asked me about loops again, and Kai previously asked about loops. So I can see Kai now telling other people that today, for whatever reason, we're not doing any little, little loops from one vertex to itself. Um, yeah, I don't know why normal graph theory, they just don't like to deal with loops. Like, they purposefully call them multi graphs and say, if you want to, you can. But I've been doing graph theory for a very long time, and I and no one ever goes, let's discuss multigraphs today. And no one Aww. likes to talk about them. That's sad. Um, I guess it would be like if on Facebook you were allowed to follow yourself, or if on yeah. Facebook you were allowed to be friends with somebody more than once. Um, it's kind of not how Facebook works. So. <laughs> well, that's very interesting that you say that, because, for example, like, there is a lot of interesting maths by drawing graphs with each person as a vertex and you connect people who are friends and you get some very interesting ideas and you can get some people who are like the center of a lot of edges and therefore you know they're popular and influential on Facebook and stuff like that. It is very interesting. Yeah. And so we can do nice maths on those kind of graphs. We, really, don't, we, we have our rules about the graph theory. Yeah. Really showing my age by using Facebook as the go-to. It should obviously be, <laughs> if you send someone a Snapchat over the TikTok, then they can reblog it or not. And it's like having that, but sending it to yourself. That's how you <laughs> down with the kids. Um, votes are coming in for the second, the middle one there on screen to be planar as well, using a similar sort of trick, I think. Yeah, You've got a picture. Really You've got to move those out. Okay. Just pull them out. Pull, pull those inner vertices out to the side, and we're fine. Oh. Um, that's that's, a <laughs> that's different. Graph. You've given us those two vertices to grab onto. I don't think it's necessary <laughs> that we grab onto the vertices to pull it out, but that does help me imagine it somehow. <laughs> It, it, it's quite a useful way of thinking about it. I chose that one specifically because it seems like it's quite nice. You could definitely imagine the, you can visualize pulling it out. For example, the one on the left and the triangle equivalents of it, it's not obvious that those are planar. Uh, those are equivalents, sorry. It's not obvious that they're the same graph. This one, you can really imagine just pulling those two vertices out and you're fine. Okay, so we're doing great. Every, everything so far has turned out to be planar. We've been moving diagonals yeah. around so that although these graphs were first presented with crisscrossing lines, and we can rearrange rearrange stuff. Um, just that last yeah. one to go then. I think it's about 50-50. Yeah. Do you want to let us know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, what I'm actually going to do, might be slightly mean here, is I'm going to leave that as a slight discussion point for something we're about to do right now. Okay. This is a very interesting graph and relates to a very, very old maths problem called the three utilities problem. So I'll explain what the three utilities problem is, and you'll see how uh, this graph comes about. Um, so suppose there are three houses that each need to be connected to water, gas, and electricity companies. So we have the water company, we have our electricity company, we have our um, gas company, and we have three houses, and they each want to be connected to them, say, by a line or by a tube or by a, or whatever means you connect to a water, gas, and electricity company. However, they want to be connected to these companies without any overlapping lines. Um, we want So basically, we're saying... You can see how this is a graph theory question, because I'm saying if our vertices are house one, house two, house three, and electricity, water, and gas, and I draw the graph, as you saw previously, like that, with house one connected to water, electricity, and gas, house two connects to water, electricity, and gas, and house three connects to water, electricity, and gas, can we do that without the lines overla overlapping, i.e., is this graph planar? So I, it was quite mean of me, of me making you see if you could do that one before, because this is actually a very complicated and difficult math problem that we're going to spend some time solving because it's such an interesting problem. So I do apologise for making you guys have a go at that, because we, we're we going to spend do some maths on how to work out whether this graph is planar or not. I think some, so, people, some people in chat spotted that maybe this reminded them of a utilities problem they'd seen before. Are we going to do this now then? <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah, let's exactly. go, let's go, okay. Um, so I'll quickly mention Euler's formula. Um, I'm purely saying Euler's formula. I'm not going to prove it. It's not too difficult to prove, actually. And if you want to go away and you've done induction, you can prove this formula quite easily. Um, but it's a very interesting part of maths. Not particularly relevant here, apart from for its final statement. We, we don't need the maths behind it. We just need to know what it says. Euler, obviously, being an amazing mathematician who has influences everywhere in maths. And this is his influence in graph theory. Um, he said, if you take a graph, um, and we've called it a connected graph, 
um, that's planar with V vertices, E edges, and F faces, like V being the number of vertices, E being the number of edges, and F being the number of faces. I'll quickly explain what a face is. Um, the face, um, the number of faces F is the number of regions the graph is div divides the plane into. So for example, I've numbered the faces for each of those graphs. Notice that the outside of a graph is also a face. Um, um, the reason I've said let G be a planar graph is because as you, I'm sure you can realize, if we've got edges overlapping, it's kind of unclear how many um, regions the graph is divided um, divided into, um, the plane is divided into, sorry. So it's slightly, we, we might not be able to work it out. So we want it to be planar. We want it to be drawn with no edges overlapping so that we can clearly see, okay, this triangle has an inside and an outside. So that's two faces. This square with the line dividing the center of it has two components. And then we've also got the outside, which gives us a third face. So, um, no need to worry about that too much. You can get very complicated if you want with that kind of stuff. But the key part of it is the number of faces F is the number of regions the plane is divided into. Um, so that's what, so if we have V vertices, E edges and F faces, then Euler's formula says that V minus E plus F is equal to two. Um, I hope some of you have seen that before. Um, you can do that with stuff like a football. You can look at, oh, can we, divide, uh, can a football be made solely out of hexagons? And then you could go, ah, no, it can't. Because if you look at vertices, edges and faces, it doesn't work out for a football. Um, um, so interestingly enough, you can do some very interesting maths here um, to do, to prove different things about various shapes and faces. Um, we're going to do it with graphs today, um, but it works. It has loads of applications all over the place. And actually Euler's formula is part of a much wider area of maths um, where you have some, uh, I won't talk too much about it, but there's something called the Euler characteristic. And if, for example, if instead of looking at a plane or a sphere, you look at different, more complicated surfaces, different, more complicated shapes, um, then the number at the end, the two, changes to a different number. Um, but Euler's formula still holds. For example, on a donut shape called a torus, V minus E plus F equals zero. Um, also, on a Klein bottle, V minus E plus F equals zero. Um, so, interesting maths that has a very wide reaching application don't worry about it now sorry for overcomplicating it this is Euler's formula v minus e plus f equals two we're going to use it to solve the three utilities problem okay if this graph is planar then v minus f uh, minus yeah v minus e plus f equals two this is only if the graph is planar this holds for all planar graphs it might hold for some non-planar graphs but we know if v minus e plus f doesn't equal two then this graph definitely isn't planar we know for this graph firstly that it's got six vertices, house one, house two, house three, water, electricity, gas, and it's got nine edges because each house is connected to all three of the companies. Um, what does F equal? That is going to be clear. That's clearly how we're going to solve this problem. We need to know what F equals. Um, we can't. Oh, so what we're going to do is imagine we were able to draw this graph in a planar way. Imagine you could draw this graph in a planar way. Could so say we look at a specific face. Can that face have two edges on the outside? Well, no, because then that face would look like this diagram here. And we've said that these kind of um, diagrams aren't allowed. We're not allowed two edges between two vertices. And therefore, a face with two edges, like if you go around the outside and count the number of edges of that face, an edge can't have two faces. So we know for certain that each face has at least three um, edges if we go around the outside. Okay. So we know it has three edges if we go around the outside. Can it have exactly three? If like, Is it possible... For me to go around the edges of a face, the, uh, the outside of a face, go around the edges, and it has three vertices or three edges around the outside. Okay, well, let's think about that. You may have noticed that I've colored the vertices here, blue and red. House one, um, house two, house three are blue, and water, electricity, and gas are red. And you'll notice that no blue vertex is joined by an edge to any other blue vertex, and no red vertex is joined by an edge to any other red vertex. Um, so that's very important. So for example, say we have a face and we were to go around the vertices on the outside of that face. So we started at a vertex. So we started at a red vertex. Okay, well, that red vertex must be connected to a blue vertex because we know red vertices aren't connected to red vertices. And then we keep going around that face. Well, that blue one must be connected to a red one. Now, can that red one be connected back to the first one? Well, no, because the first one was also red and red vertices aren't connected to each other. So you can see that... The not, if you go around the edges, the vertices on the outside of a face, there's going to have to be an even number of them um, 
because we need to alternate colors as we go around. Um, and therefore, we can't have three um, vertices on the outside of the face if we go around the outside of the face. We're going to need to have at least four. We know we can't have two either because we just stated that. So what we've worked out to simplify all of that is if this graph could be drawn in a planar way and we read, went around the vertices on the outside of any given face, it must have at least four vertices. And that means at least four edges. Because if you look around the outside, the number of vertices isn't the same as the number of edges. So that means if we look at the outside of a number of um, uh, the outside of a face, we go around is going to have at least four edges as we go around that face. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, each edge belongs to exactly two faces. We know that each edge is going to be on the like we take an edge, there'll be a face one side of it and a face the other side of it. That's what an edge is going to do. It's going to have a face either side of it. So what we'll do is we'll choose a face and we'll go around and we're going to try and find a relation between the number of edges and the number of faces. So we know that each face has at, at least four edges around the outside and that each edge belongs to exactly two faces. So what that means is if we divide the number of edges by four so that we have at least the number of faces, but timesing it by two because each edge will um, apply to two different faces, that's got to be greater than or equal to the number of faces. Um, I'll just explain that again because that was a lot of words that sound quite complicated. We know that each face must have at least four edges on its outside and that each edge belongs to two faces. So we times the number of edges by two and divide by four and we must have at least the number of faces. Um, that There's quite a complicated statement. I, I the, the, the logic is not too complicated, but saying it, it's a lot of words and a lot of things thrown at you. So maybe if you want to understand that more, Ideally, you could think about maybe if I draw a bunch of um, faces with four edges and just one with five edges, why that would mean the number of faces is less than or equal to two times the number of edges divided by four. Um, have a go. Um, hopefully, the logic makes sense to most of you. Um, it's a bit complicated, I agree. But um, it's, it follows from the fact that each face has at most at least four edges around the outside and that each edge belongs to two faces. So we know that the faces is less than or equal to two of the edges divided by four, which is the number of edges divided by two, which is four and a half, because we know that the number of edges is nine, because um, each house is connected to all three of the water, electricity, and gas, so the number of edges is three times three. Just to check, so, just to check Jonah, sorry to jump in, question from chat. It's a subtle argument, right, that each edge belongs to exactly two faces, because my first reaction is, that the edge has two the two sides. If my edge is vertical, I've got a left side and a right side. Um, how do I actually know those are different faces? Because I think you showed us a diagram um, before where, where there's an example where the little edge came down and there was a face that was turned out to be the same face on both sides. Is that yeah, that's a really that's a really good point. Um, the, the interesting fact about that is, yeah, you're completely right. Um, you can have uh, to, to simplify the argument. I was assuming that each edge has. Um, different face either side of it but you'll notice that if it has the same face either side of it and we do the same counting argument when we go around and count the number of edges if a face has the same face either side of it we'll actually count it twice um so this is and so therefore yeah so because you're doing a bound on the number of faces you're saying could you say something like each edge has a most two faces i think i've got yeah, confused about what a face is that makes the argument quite complicated yeah um, if you think about it, say we had that triangle again with the one line going down and we go around the outside of it, we count the triangle, but then to get back to where we started, we have to go down that vertex and back up it again. So we're going to have to count that edge twice. And you could see that if an edge does have the same face on each side of it, it is a, it's going to be double counted in the argument. And therefore, um, it's got, it, it counts as twice here. So therefore, our, our argument does hold a number of faces is definitely less than or equal to four and a half. That's very subtle. I like the kind of yeah. pure math conclusion of it. The faces, if this were a planar graph, because faces are a thing about planar graphs. You're telling me mm. if this was a planar graph, if this were a planar graph, and you'd rearrange all the edges and you'd stop moving things, then you've proved that it would have at most four and a half faces. Because exactly, of your knowledge yeah. of, um, even after the deforming, you can think about what those faces would look like after, after you're done. Okay, it's a very subtle kind of hypothetical argument if you turned it into a, a planar graph. What would it be like? Oh, it'd be a bit weird. It would only have at most four and a half faces. I think you're about to tell me that that's not enough faces. Yeah, it is definitely not. No, no, so you know how much VMP. Are, 
Yeah, so V minus E plus F, that means it's less than or equal to 6 minus 9 plus 4.5, which is 1.5, which is less than 2. So we can't have V minus E plus F for this graph equaling 2, as Euler's formula says it must, and hence this graph isn't planar. It's a very long argument to explain something that a lot of people in chat just guessed immediately, that this graph isn't planar. But now we have a very solid mathematical foundation as to why it's not planar. I might need to, I might need to watch back again for the bit with the um the counting the subtle counting argument that gave us four point five. Yeah, okay, it's quite okay. a subtle argument. Good. Um. But anyway, so <laughs> we've got uh the, this this part. Don't worry, this isn't going to get as as complicated as that part just was. Um. I, I mentioned a torus slightly. So we've proven that the three utilities problem does not have a solution in the plane. Now we ask, does it have a solution on a torus? And the, for those of you who don't know, a torus is a donut shape. So three utilities problem on a torus. Well, we um we can't draw this graph on the plane, but could we draw it on a donut? So let's have first look at what a torus actually looks like. There, as you can see, the uh, the shape on the left is our donut shape, and I've drawn a red line and a green line along it. Um, we're going to cut along those lines and just remember that those two lines are actually the same line. So what I mean by that is I'm going to cut A, I'm going to cut at A first and kind of stretch it out into a cylinder and just remember that those two red lines at A are the same line. They're actually the same point. So if I was to travel along that cylinder and get to the end by that red line, uh, by the red line at the end on the right, I'm going to appear back at the left because it's, a do it's actually a donut shape. I've just cut along it. I'm just imagining um, it's just... Um, I have imagined it's a tube, but it's actually still a donut shape. And similarly, we can cut along that green line and kind of unfold our cylinder into a square. And all, and so this is quite a common representation of a torus um, in this kind of square shape, where we remember that the top and bottom of that square are actually the same line, and the left and right of that square are actually the same line. So if I was to travel along that red line and go off toward on the right side, I'm going to appear back on the left side. And if I was to travel off to the top, I'm going to appear at the bottom. So these two shapes are actually the same shape. I've just drawn it in a more convenient way for me to draw this problem. Um, ho hopefully that's clear to everybody. And I'm hoping they're agreeing that that does make sense. Uh, chat, <laughs> chat like, give us a second. It's like Pac-Man, right? <laughs> Pretty yeah, my age. Exactly. <laughs> it's like Pac-Man where you go off one side and you come back on the other. Oh, I'm in a square hmm. right now. Let's imagine that I can hang on. Hang on, I'm so you're gonna try do... coming off one side. You're gonna it's gonna be up. the most amazing magic trick you've ever seen. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the Pac-Man thing, but with this pencil. Um, I'm also gonna send the pencil the correct direction. There we go. Okay, okay. I'm gonna do it. It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be amazing. Okay, I need to send the pencil like that. No, I haven't thought this through. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be such a good magic trick, Jonah. It's gonna really demonstrate the point that you're making. I no. wish they did this in my lectures. It's also mirrored. I really haven't thought this through. I somehow still can't get this because it's mirrored. Hang on, I, I'm going to have one more go, one more go, one more go. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. It's brilliant, it's perfect, it's amazing. That is brilliant, that is there obviously the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah! <laughs> Can I go back again? Yes! Oh, oh there we go. I demonstrated your point beautifully. Oh, I just put it down, it should have come in the top. Right, okay. I, don't, I don't even need to do a formal mathematical proof. I could have just provided that. That is a formal mathematical proof that James is in the Taurus. <laughs> We've got five minutes, Jonah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I'll get on with what my point is here. Um, say, okay, we'll put our vertices on the torus like that. We know we can move them about wherever we like. So I put house one, house two, house three, water, electricity, gas, and I've coloured those lines. So the green lines are the same and the red lines are the same. I'll first put some edges in like that. Um, so does how, how, how far are we to solving the utility problem? Well, we can see that house one is connected to water and electricity, but still needs to be connected to gas. House two is connected to all three, so that's good. And house three is connected to electricity and gas, but not water. So we need to connect house three to water and house one to gas, but we don't want them to overlap. Now, first we notice that these two yellow, the two yellow crosses, hopefully you can see that, on the red side are actually the same point because those red lines are the same line. And those two green, uh, those two blue crosses on the green lines are actually the same point because those green lines are the same line. So I, from house one, I could travel up to that blue cross at that green line, appear out the bottom, and then connect it to gas like that. So house one can be connected like that to gas. And similarly, house three can be connected to water by traveling up to the yellow line there, appearing the other side, and then traveling up to water like that. 
So, as you can see, hopefully from that, that this is a solution to the three utilities problem on a torus, because house one, house two, and house three are all connected to, um, like, to each other. So, um, to sorry, to th the three water, electricity, and gas companies. So, it is working very nicely, and this is a solution to the utilities problem. So, I hope you guys can enjoy that. Um, Ta-da. <laughs> You've solved it. The trick now would be to roll it up, to print it out on a bit of paper, roll it up to demonstrate that you've solved it on the Taurus. I believe Matt Parker's company, um, Maths Gear, sells a mug that you can do this on. So a mug with a handle, um, and the handle of the mug is a bit like a Taurus. Um, I mean, it's isomorphic to a Taurus if we're, if we're using that word today. Um, so it's got the utilities problem printed on the mug, and it looks like a sort of puzzle where you have to connect them. But the only way to do it is to utilize the, the handle of the mug. Sorry, that was a terrible utilities pun. Um, right, yes, don't. Advice in chat is that do not use donuts and mugs. Do not try and drink off squares after your coffee cup. Um, <laughs> someone has tried to draw a four dimensional Mobius strip in chat. I can't. I think it hasn't rendered very well on my screen. Um, it even is a four dimensional Mobius strip. I don't know. <laughs> just, yeah, somebody... Mobius strip is a three-dimensional shape. I I, I'm interested to know what a four-dimensional Mobius strip is. Is a Mobius strip a sort of a two-dimensional shape, like a square with the edges identified yeah, in a weird well, interesting, way? Interesting, you know, completely unrelated to this talk at all. But Mobius strips are two dimensions with a certain like twist with them, and therefore you can't embed a Mobius strip in two dimensions, but you can embed one in three dimensions. And then if you think about the Klein bottle, which is the Mobius strip, but you've kind of connected the two edges of the Mobius strip together, that can't be embedded in three dimensions, but can be embedded in four dimensions. And I think I'll... Oh, you've got, here is you've my, got a Klein bottle! <laughs> I've got a Klein bottle right here. And This, this is, is the topology example. live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do really like talking about... I realise I could talk about topology for hours and hours. We but have a previous about. episodes that people um, enjoyed a lot with Flora. Um, I'll put a link to it in the further reading notes. Um, everybody likes Flora. Uh, and that's got some more topology stuff on. Do you want to state the four colour thing? Um, yeah. Should we, should we state I, there it? There was a lot we more might... I was hoping to say, but yeah. I'll just quickly uh, state sorry. it. So, <laughs> this is a lot of interesting stuff. It was preamble to the four colour theorem. Don't worry about it. I'm sure I can add the slides maybe to the further reading if people are interested. Um, the four color theorem states that any map can be colored by four colors in such a way that no two countries, regions which share a border are the same color. You may have heard of this four color theorem before um, or not. Um, it's a very interesting theorem and it has been, un I mean, fine. It has been a very interesting theorem in maths for a very, very long time. Ignore the, the, basically we can convert this four color theorem to a statement in graph theory. That's what all the slides were about before, how we can convert map colorings to um, statements about graph theory and how this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So um, the four color theorem is actually stating something about coloring the vertices of a graph. But the key thing about this thing is it is a question about graph theory and this theorem has only ever been proved computationally because there are, this is a theorem about planar graphs and you can actually classify planar graphs into finitely many cases. You can actually run them all through a computer and the computer spits out yes, I have successfully managed to color the vertices um, with no more than four colors of all of these planar graphs. So ran through the thousands and thousands of cases and said, yes, this does hold true. No planar graph can be colored, but you don't need more than four colors to color all the vertices of a planar graph. Um, me and James probably disagree on whether that counts as a formal mathematical proof. I am very much of the opinion that that is not a mathematical proof and the proof we did earlier for the utilities problem was a mathematical proof. So um, I think hopefully there is one out there that people are yet to find. Maybe one of you guys can give it a go. If you do solve it, you do have to give me 50% of any winnings. I am going to, I'm pretty insistent on that. I'm, um, okay. So you, you foolishly told me that you were going to do this at the start of the live stream, I know in advance. So I've been able to prepare some cunning arguments back. <laughs> um, oh no, I don't know. think you're going to get, I don't think you're going to get winnings. I'm sorry. I don't think you're going to get winnings for reproving it because, as far as I can tell, it's it's fully proved. Okay, a computer was involved, but I think it's fully proved. If you don't accept that, maybe you'd accept the computer could print out its proof, <laughs> and then after it's printed it, do you still call it a computational proof? What do you actually want? Here? What do you want? I want a math a proof 
that uses maths rather than exhaustion to solve it. That that the, the, I don't like a proof that just st like tries every single possible way and goes okay. Therefore, we def it's definitely holds true because I couldn't couldn't find any any examples where it didn't work. I like a nice concise oh. mathematics proof where you use logic to reach an endpoint. I think it's I think I think exhaustion proof by exhaustion is a sort of mathematics. Um, and I can tell that this this argument is going to go a little bit wrong if we keep going too far. Um, also, you did allied a little bit um, that it's, there are infinitely many cases because there's infinitely many graphs. There was a lot of clever mathematical work to convert the, the cases, like sort of relevant cases, into a finite list. That's not trivial. That's not obvious. Um, mm. It wasn't just a case of building a really powerful computer that could check things until it got bored. It was reducing this infinite complicated problem down to a, a finite set of of interesting problems. There's a lot of maths in there, but I don't think we should. I don't think we should sell that short just because a computer then did the boring bit. <laughs> Computers are always doing boring things. Um, people are asking application questions in chat, which I think means that I should try and answer those application questions in chat. I think I'll do that after we're not live anymore. Um, and I think it's time to say thank you very much for being on the live stream, Jonah. I think people would like your slides in the further reading as well. Is there anything you'd like to say at the end before we wrap up for the day? Go no, for just like, thank you for having me. And I hope you guys do go away and look up some graph theory because it's really interesting and loads of mathematicians are currently studying it. And it's really, really great way to get your foot in the door in some modern current maths. I think you've demonstrated that there is stuff that we can just about understand the proof of if we sat down and went away and thought about it a bit to try I think I could understand the utilities thing if I w watched the video back and and maybe read the further reading notes just a bit of a tautology because I haven't written them yet okay <laughs> thank you very much Jonah thanks for everyone watching um, have a wonderful evening and rest of your week my day's gone up to five stars um, and we will see you in 167 hours for another episode of the Altered Online Maths Club bye <laughs>